Before we get started this morning, a great thank you again to ATEC and Wilson Sports for their continued sponsorship of the ABCA. After a 14-year professional playing career, Bobby Scales has worked in pro baseball for nearly a decade and currently serves as the assistant field coordinator for the Pittsburgh Pirates organization. In that capacity, he is responsible for the execution of organizational standards and the professional development of minor league coaches and players as they matriculate through the Pirates minor league system. From 2012 to 2015, he was the director of player development for the Los Angeles Angels. In 2015, Scales were promoted to the special assistant to the general manager, where he evaluated professional and amateur players both internationally and domestically. As a player, Scales reached the majors with the Chicago Cubs and finished his career in Japan. Please welcome to the stage, Bobby Scales. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Bobby Scales, and I'm here to present the art of steel. So the first thing I want to, under to understand is that, you know, stealing is such a taboo thing in our society, right? Um, what is the definition of stealing? Well, steal, you know, Webster defines it as to take another person's property without permission or legal right, without intention of returning it. Obviously, we're not doing that. Uh, stealing in our game is legal. Uh, there is risk to it. But for the purpose of what we're doing, uh, the, the definition is to gain an advantage unexpectedly or by exploiting the temporary distraction of our opponent. Stealing in our society is taboo and the consequences for doing so are heavy. Obviously, one of the Ten Commandments in the good book is thou shalt not steal. The penalty for stealing oxen or a sheep or some type of livestock is a heavy repayment, up to five times that which you stole. The penalty for stealing food can be up to sevenfold. Fast forward to modern day, even petty theft. Only $50 worth of property can get you up to six months in jail and a $1,000 fine. Seems like a high rate of, of, of penance for that which you stole. So we have to examine, one, what is the mentality of thieves and criminals? Why do they steal and when they steal? Dr. Claire Nee has done extensive research. She's a psychologist at the University of Bournemouth in England. Done extensive research in this area and written volumes of publications talking about the mentality of thieves. There's a few things that are pretty much universal throughout all types of thieves whether they be robbers, bank robbers, armed robbers, uh, burglars, or what, whatever, how, whatever method they use to acquire illegally what they acquire, there's a level of pre preparation, there's a focus on efficiency, and also a, a, a further focus on executing the crime itself. So for the purpose of what we're doing, so why does this, why does this have anything to do with stealing bases, the art of stealing bases? Well, in the research that I, that, I, that I came across for this presentation, uh, it seemed like burglars, and Dr. Nee backs this up with her writing, burglars have a level of intelligence that typically goes a little bit higher than most. And, and the reason why is their preparation was superior to that of other, of other criminals. This gentleman, and I use that term loosely, uh, Michael Shane Durden, is a, one of the most prolific criminals in the state of Texas, in the history of the state of Texas, for, for 20 years, uh, leading up to his capture in 2011, he perpetrated crimes, he perpetrated burglaries all over the North Dallas uh, metropolitan area. Um, one of the things that he wanted to do a, as a means of, of paying his, his debt to society, he's in jail currently and will be for the rest of his life, but one of the things he felt like he needed to do was let people know how he did what he did. The level of expertise, the level of reconnaissance, the level of patience, the level of preparation he went to to execute these crimes was mind-blowing. There were times where he talked about running, his, 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 the way he would case a neighborhood, the way he would begin his research is he would literally jog through neighborhoods and just watch, watch people, watch the people watching their dogs walking their dogs. He watched the people that had a lot of trash stacked up in their, in, in their, in their driveway. Maybe the, the trash cans hadn't been either taken out or returned back to where they need to go. That indicated to him that they weren't home. That's one mark. If there was a bunch of newspapers in the lawn, 
That's more information he's gathering. That's one mark. If he noticed cameras, he'd stay away from that. If he noticed wireless home security systems, he'd stay away from that because they are, they're, they're, they're not easily defeated. If people were getting new windows, he, uh, he, try, he tried to have an understanding of what kind of windows they were. Were they double pane? Were they single pane? He did his homework uh, with window stores to understand which ones were made of what material, what types of glass, because some are louder than others when they broke them. What am I getting at? You have to be prepared. We don't run to run. When we are stealing bases, we will not run to run. I got a feeling, not acceptable. Well, I thought I could get the bag, not acceptable. The level of preparation is key to being successful at stealing bases at a high level. So the first question is, we look at the game as it is now, you know, where it's been, where it's going. Where have the stolen bases gone? Uh, the research that I did here uh, from 20, the 2010 Major League season to 2019, obviously 2020 was kind of a wash with the number of games and just the fractured nature of the season. But we did a 10-year study here. If you look, obviously the games are somewhat consistent. There's only a four-game variation uh, between uh, you know, 2010 and 2019 in any given year. The stolen base attempts, SBA, uh, in 2010, they were at 4,088, as you can all see here, and they fall precipitously over the next 10 years to 3,112. Obviously, stolen bases, uh, the, the successful attempts, gone down. Caught stealings have actually gone down as well. The one thing that I did note that was, that was interesting to me is that the percentage stayed somewhat stagnant, only from 70 to 74%, uh, just a 4% variance. Um, and then the, the one thing that was also startling is the attempts per game has gone down exponentially over that same period of time. Now, there's reasons behind that. As we've moved through in this era of baseball, the extra base hit has really um, been more important and been placed on really driving the baseball and extra base hit. Uh, and, and I have the analyst second. I probably should have that first. But uh, the, with the proliferation of the numbers in the, in the sports and the analytics in our game, you know, the analysts have pretty much decided that if you cannot steal at a clip of 80 percent or better, the expected run value isn't something it, it, basically it's not worth the risk to go. If you if you're stealing at 75, 76 percent, that's great. But our expected run value doesn't go up in a given in, in a given situation now. This that's in a vacuum. Some of these situations are a lot different than others, but overall as a whole. So that said, it makes more sense for guys to try to impact the game by getting extra base hits as opposed to try to impact the game by getting one uh, 90 feet at a time and not doing so from home plate. Also, too, any analyst will tell you the bane of their existence is making it out on the basis, not making it out from the plate will hurt you more than any, any given out from home plate. Because that given out from home plate also has an opportunity to get an extra base hit in the form of a double, triple, or a homer. Also, too, from a sports science perspective, if you look at what we know about the aging curve and what we know about the impact curve on your body, sports scientists will tell you all the pounding that the body takes in sliding and being on the ground and hitting the ground as much as guys who really run a boat a, a lot do, over the course of time, we're pretty certain that things of that nature shorten the career span. So now if you, if you think about it from a player perspective, if I'm a guy and I can steal 25 to 30 bags, but I can also hit 35 to 40 doubles, will I be able to hit those 35 to 40 doubles longer in my career than I'll be able to get 25 to 30 bags or the other way around? I think the answer is pretty clear. That's why a lot of guys don't run near as much as they used to run uh, in years past. Also, too, uh, it goes without saying, pitchers have done a much better job as well. Uh, the slide step used to be something that was you know, reserved for guys that were really athletic and could really control their bodies. Now it's pretty much standard issue. You won't find a pitcher or a program teaching pitchers that either doesn't teach the slide step exclusively or doesn't teach it as, 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 a, as, a, as a weapon in the arsenal to controlling the running game. So these are all real reasons why uh, the stolen base has kind of gone away. So back to the mentality of the thief. Okay. Dr. Knee 
in her writings and just the people you talk to, what do real base dealers do? Well, the first thing is they believe. What do robbers do? What do, what do, what do criminals do? They believe they're going to get away with it. They believe they're going to get away with it every time. They have zero remorse. They're not sorry until they get caught. Michael Shane Durden wasn't sorry for 20 years. He was sorry that 20th year and that first day he got caught and he was in, he was in handcuffs. Here's the one that's the key for me. Thieves, really good stolen base artists, they are prepared. They are prepared to the nth degree. From a mental standpoint, KTS, what does KTS stand for? Know thyself. Opposition reconnaissance. What about my opposition do I need to know before I can take off? And they understand risk calculation. Risk calculation is one of the most important things. Because in this situation, is the, is the reward of me getting this 90 feet worth the risk of me getting thrown out? And that's something that, that, that there's no real sliding scale. There's no real, I know some of the analysts get mad at this. There's no real metric for that. Because it, it's based on what the scoreboard tells us. We'll get to that in a moment. From a physical standpoint, again, know thyself. How fast am I really? Am I really as fast as I think I am? What kind of jumps do I get? Where am I explosive in my, in, in my, in my path to the next base? Part of uh, the physical part is also skill mastery. You don't see many guys practicing their steel jumps. You don't see many guys practicing sliding. You don't see many guys practicing getting back to bags on pickoff attempts. Those are skills that can be practiced and should be practiced and you can master those skills so that when you're called on to execute those skills, they're there. The last portion I want to talk about is something that we as coaches control. It's the environment. Okay? The environment. When you get a guy thrown out, bang, bang, and all he sees is your back, you're turned around and, and you're, you know, palms to the sky and you're, I can't believe this hat off, throwing stuff, whatever. You are now telling that guy that I don't want you running. And for me, that is the biggest deterrent. That is the number one deterrent. That's bigger than the slide step. That's bigger than, than you know, the, 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 the amount of um, ground contacts you have in a given season. That is the biggest deterrent two guys becoming prolific base dealers again. If you're a kid, stove's on, put your hand on the stove, you burn your hand, how likely are you to put your hand back on the stove? You're not. Okay? You're not. I get a good jump. I know, I, you know, I, I, I know myself. I know my opposition. It's a good time to go. I feel good physically. I know I'm going to slide with foot accuracy and velocity into the base. Guy comes up, boom, boom, bang, bang, play, I'm out. I turn and look at my third base coach. He's turned away from me. Coach in dugout's got his hat off. How likely is that guy to take off again? Even when he's in an advantageous uh, situation to steal the bag. He's not. Because what you have done is you have deterred him because of your, um, your actions. Okay? So understanding that the environment that you create as a coach is going to play into how prolific you are as, stolen, as, 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 a, as a team or as a program in terms of stealing bases is a huge piece, okay? And then the, the last thing, and, 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 and Durden talked about this in his uh, video um, with the police department. I was looking for flawless execution. My execution had to be flawless. When I'm in the house, when I'm in the house, I prepared mentally, I prepared physically, I know my, my environment is allowing me to do what I need to do. I'm going to get exactly what I need to get, and I'm not going to be greedy. So the flawless execution of all of the things that happened before that moment is vital to success in stealing bases. So now know thyself. How fast am I really? Okay. How fast am I really? Do I know my own speed? Do I know what numbers I need and what numbers are significant? I've got 10, 20 on here. 10 is your 10 yard burst out of your, out of your primary lead. 20 is the next 20 yards. 
So we're talking about 10 yards. That's, that's uh, 10 yards. That's 30 feet. And then 20 yards, that's the next 60 feet. Okay. So we're talking about a 70 foot span. Okay. Lead the to touch. Do I know what I need lead to touch at second base to get the bag? Do I know what these numbers are? Okay. Because if I don't, it's kind of a guesstimate. Know thyself. These are 10 and 20 yard times for some players in our org in Pittsburgh Pirate organization. The names are changed, so don't try to don't try to get any of our proprietary knowledge. Okay, um, but it's not rocket science. So what we did, we started this. We started doing this in, in spring training of 2019. We had the 10 yard burst. This is all electronically cut the time through gate testing. We got their 10 yard burst. We got their 20 yard burst. We've got the 10 yard and 20 yard in spring training of 2020. Uh, obviously, unfortunately, we got shut down. We all know why. And we've got the improvement net metrics and the time decrease. Okay. This is important because one, two things. Number one, our players know. Our players know. They know exactly what their times are. The second piece of why it's important is because we have changed, we've changed programming during these years to help enhance these numbers. Okay. We've changed the way we dynamic warm up. We've changed the way we run bases. We've changed some of the things that we've done to make the, the skill acquisition of speed training part of what we do in our baseball practice too often it's looked at something that's ancillary to what we're trying to get done and there it takes up time and so we can't commit to it no no we've integrated a lot of the things we do into our dynamic warm-up and even broken it down by position the outfielders don't warm up the same as the infielders and don't warm up the same as the catchers they have very different skill sets and we've broken that down and we've changed some of the things we do it's not rocket science i'm not giving away any secrets if you're smart you're doing these things already here we have a probability chart, okay? What we have here is our 20 yards straight steal time, or 20 yards straight time. That's the 40 yards between our 10 yard burst and our, our slide time, our slide area, which is about a 10, about a 10 uh, approximately a 10 foot span, okay? Stolen base rate. Our guys have been able to calculate, at least using some of the numbers, if, we, if, our, if our 20 yard straight time is 2.5 seconds for the young man at the top, and we get a pitch, a deliver, a pitch, the pitcher delivers the ball to home plate at 1.3 seconds. That's the percentage we will, probably, we will probably be safe at second base. So that being said, obviously when we get in our green zones, 1-4, one, 1-5, one, one, you know, 1-4-5, uh, 1-5, and 1-5-5, five, five, those are the rates at which if you run that time, we believe that you will be safe. Now, we know that green, it means go. Let's go. Let's get these bags in that area. The yellow means we can still go, and we still kind of like our chances, but we need more info. More info in the form of, of pitcher tells, and we'll get to that in a moment, okay? I have three young men highlighted there because they have very unique situations. That young man in, in, the, in the pink color at the top only has three zones of green means go. Let's go. We get this time when you're over there. Let's go. That young man had 35 bags last year, which tells us by reasonable deduction, he's very good at one, three, five and one, four. And the reason he's good is because he gets unbelievable tells. He can, he can find something on a pitcher and lock in and it be correct faster than anybody at his age. He's in the low minor leagues. He at, at his age, than I've ever seen, okay? Let's go down to the young man, Luis. This young man had 27 bags last year. 27 bags from a guy who has no green on his profile. Again, same thing. His intelligence and his preparation are superior, and technically, he's incredible. There's zero wasted motion and zero wasted steps, and this young man, and it wasn't that way. He has worked extensively on it and been very good at it. And then the final uh, young man there in the purple, 11 out of 14. He's one of the best opportunities I've ever seen. He does all his on some of the timing. He can pick, figure out a pitcher's timing. Again, there's no green in his profile. And he's probably at the, at the ceiling of the amount of bases he can get. But all the opportunities he gets where he gets, he gets the information he needs to go, he executes flawlessly, and he's safe at second base. There's a lot of ways to get this done. But it all, does all come down to preparation, 
and exe- preparation and then execution and understanding what you need to know from a mental standpoint. So knowing your opponent, information about the battery. These are all things that we know. Times home, the arsenal, strike percentage. Does this guy throw a boatload of strikes? Is he in the strike zone? Because if he's not and he's throwing scuds all over the zone, it's difficult for our catchers to throw. Okay. Tendencies. Moves and tells. Okay. Starters versus relievers. A lot of times, those guys are very different creatures. Even the ones that used to start, and they're in a bullpen now, they, they, sometimes they just turn, tend to morph into people. Okay? So this is a chart. This is a starter chart from a, from, from a National League team. Okay? All the names are blacked out. Okay? But what you will see is we've got times to plate. We've got pickoff move. Break, the second gentleman here breaks his knees to pick, low threat to pick over. So we have information. We've done our homework, we, whether it be via, via scout, whether it be via um, uh, video scouting, whether it be via just information. Again, understand something. Data is, the, are, is also not just numbers, but good data is also things that you see. That's real data too, right? So however we acquire that data, we put it in to what, you know, what these things look like. So key on, right? Stop with head up, build a cap drops to start at second base, come set looking at third base, check runner. And if he drops uh, the bill of his cap, we can go then, right? We've got run on him. In these counts, he's slower to the plate. So the second guy, uh, 202131 oh, again traditional counts that if we get get in in an advantageous situation we want to go why because pitchers are typically slower as they get back in the counts or what we're seeing now in the, uh, a lot in the game of baseball plus counts for a hitter are big breaking ball counts okay again reconnaissance this is part of our game card that goes in the back pocket of our first base coach and it's not available on the bench okay so we've got information on our starters Right. And one thing I do want to point out on the right side of this column, dirt ball, likelihood that the guy throws the balls in the dirt, average high, high speaks to what the arsenal the pitcher has It's probably uh, it's either some type of really wicked um, uh, uh, wipeout pitch, whether it be a slider or a curveball or possibly a split. There's a lot of balls in the dirt possible you know we can take off and just steal there or we can get a dirt ball read that's a different topic for another time i understand that but again i think that's very important to, for us to understand relievers same type of thing one thing i will say about relievers and we will, it'll be illustrated here in, in the in the video clips that i show relievers do not typically want to throw over especially high leverage guys they do not want to throw over they don't want to be bothered with people on base a lot of times they're not good at it because they're really good they got really good stuff and they don't have a lot of traffic and so when guys get on base it could be an opportunity for guys to take advantage okay again you guys can read this all right times at the plate pick off move key on okay and one thing i want to talk about in terms of keys for a long time i was a big believer you read from the bottom up just reading through this document and just talking to people. I, I actually talked to a, a, a gentleman who is a big time base dealer in his day in the major leagues, many years, couple stolen base crowns. And I asked him, I said, Hey, what do you look at? What is one of your keys? How do you read pictures? He goes, I go from the bottom up. So he starts to talk about how he goes from the bottom up. Next thing you know, everything he says, yeah, when he came, when he came set high here, I knew it was a fastball. When he was here, it was a curveball. Well, and and, and uh, this guy, he would, he would be open. And then when he closed, I would do this. It seemed, it was funny. He said, I read from the bottom up, but everything he talked about was upper body. So I have actually honestly changed. I teach, I try to teach guys to read from the top down now. Um, I was taught bottom up. I taught bottom up for a long time. And talking to him and reading some of the reports and doing these things, I've kind of almost changed. I've, you look at the whole picture, obviously you start, but it seems like guys have more tendencies to start from the top down, especially with the head, especially with left-handers. The head is a massive piece. So we can understand what the head is doing when they deliver the ball home versus what it's doing when you go to to to, home, uh, to the first base. I think you have an opportunity for a big advantage. Okay. Knowing the opponent. Again, catcher, pop times. Okay. That's standard information. We need to know. If this guy's got an absolute rocket, if it's 1-9 uh, pretty consistently, then probably going to stay put unless... The pitcher's giving us something something else. Now, 
if actually in 201 was major league average last year 201 so it's not some kind of crazy time. Everybody in the big leagues doesn't throw one one eight six. Actually, none of them do. On average, they may pop one, but it's on average it's one nine. Okay, stances. Big thing that's happening in catching now is the knee, is is the guys on one knee. I'm a believer. If we got a guy back there and he's on one knee, I got to see it first. Now there's guys out there who are unbelievable. Nola with San Diego. We're not going anywhere because he's unbelievable off one knee. But there's other guys out there who aren't. And if we got a guy back there who's on one knee, in in a in a when there's runners on base, I gotta have that bag. I at least gotta try. He's gotta show me first. One thing that's a big piece uh, for catchers is in and out. Okay, if you see a catcher slide in, and I know catchers aren't moving near as much as they used to or near as early, but if you see a catcher slide in towards the inside part of the plate, so if you're left-handed hitter, catcher slides this way, right-handed obviously it's the other direction. There's a lot of traffic in there. They're trying to throw that ball in. Now, it also speaks to the pitcher. Is he able to hit his spots? If he's been hitting his spots consistently on a, uh, a day in, day out, uh, inning in, inning out basis, and he slides in, and it's a pretty good chance we go in there, I may take a chance right there because there's traffic in there. There's a reason pitch outs are pitch outs or pitch outs because you're going away from where the traffic is. It gives the catcher an, a, a, a better opportunity to throw. One last piece that we don't really focus on quite a bit is the transfer and the accuracy, okay? If a guy has a rocket back there, but he's fumbling or it's a slow transfer, we may have a chance. If a guy has a rocket back there and he's throwing it all over a lot, we may have a chance. Okay. Again, we have information on our game card about the catchers. Okay. Um, the interesting thing is that top, the top is not, uh, the top number is right-handed pitchers. The bottom is left. Okay. And so, um, Pretty simple information, all right? Give us a little more. There's a little more to that for the purposes of, of protecting our own information. There's stuff down there I could not show, so uh, bear with me. But just understand, you need to have information on your catchers, okay? Catcher's info. Again, this is exactly what I just talked about. Major League average is in the white right there. Two, 201. That's Major League average. You've got the high end. Rio Muto's unbelievable. We know that. 189 is on average. That's incredible, right? The one I want to focus on is you look at Walters and Alfaro. 197 for Walters, 194 for Alfaro. The interesting part of that is how they arrive at that. So we've got the arm strength on the left. Um, Walters on the lower end of arm strength, but he has the best exchange, 0.65, right? Uh, Alfaro, strong arm on the upper end for arm strength. His, his is slightly lower, Okay. So that said, there's a lot of ways to get to it, but I just think it's interesting to understand what the what the exchange is. And in, in reviewing for, for this presentation, both those guys are very accurate. Okay. So again, reconnaissance, opposition info, got to know about our catchers. Now, calculating the risk, right? The scoreboard will tell you everything you need to know about a given situation. We'll get to some of this in a second as we run through these videos, right? Where we are in the lineup, any score outs. Where we are in the lineup in defensive alignment. In my opinion, we don't get third base as much, especially with left-handed hitters up, because the third baseman, in, in, at least at the upper levels of baseball, because we have a lot of information, the third baseman are playing shortstop or far off the bag quite a bit. It is very difficult to hit a moving target accurately. Catchers hate throwing to a moving target. I think we need to take more risk at third base there. Okay, physical, winning up front. Talked about it earlier. Lead length. Average lead length of, of, of stolen bases in the big leagues last year of successful attempts was 11.2. Average caught stealing length was 10.8. That's six inches. Doesn't seem like much, but when you're talking about bang, bang plays, it, it seems like it, it, it ends up being the difference, right? Secondly, winning up front at second base, getting some type of motion. There's only a few guys in this game that can steal bags from a standstill uh, at second base. Virtually impossible, Okay. Uh, I say virtually impossible, very difficult because it is, it is, has, it is, it has been done. Okay. So drive phase, you'll hear me say drive, strive and attack drive phase, the wasted inefficient steps, at the beginning of the action of, of leading of, 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 um, stealing, I think is where we lose more than anything else between the lead and the inefficient steps in the beginning is where we lose most of our stolen bases. Okay. When we're in route, the stride. Right after that drive phase, the body has to organize itself to get in good line and get in good rhythm. Okay, the quicker we can do that and accomplish that, 
we get we we got a better chance of of getting to our top speed and then so as we go here this is young man Jared Olive in our organization he's done an unbelievable job uh of of really cleaning up his efficiency uh through some of the things that we've done getting his center mass moving that is the key now he's over that front foot we've got an incredible shin angle uh we've got a, a, a really good triple extension in the backside knee hip ankle good take up there boom you see that left foot is grabbing the ground the foot plant from above is incredible he's grabbing the ground right there we all talk about ground forces whether it be pitching whether it be hitting whether it be whatever he's grabbing that ground and using that ground to his advantage boom active recovery stop right there another incredible position Okay, as he comes up out of it, head still down, body's beginning to organize. He's on stride. Right foot, right leg, in sync with the left arm. Now we're, now we're organized. Boom, and we're off. Okay? Center mass moving. Now there's a lot of talk about the drop step. He slides. It's like a negative move. It's really not. You'll find very few people that can steal from that position. This is not a track start. Okay? Very few people that can steal from that position that don't have that step. And one thing that we have found is whatever you do, do that and train it. If you have a guy that does not have that drop step, that's fine. If you have a guy that does, that's fine too. Train it. Make it the best and most efficient you can be. There's no wasted energy. There's no wasted action in this, in this move right here. And that's why he's been very pro prolific at stealing. He got 40 bags between AA, AAA in the Fall League last year of 2019. Really good year. Okay. So, at the business end, we got to attack. Drive, stride, and attack. We have to attack the appropriate corner of the base with a slide that will allow us to arrive aggressively but maintain contact with the base. All of that is important. Is there, at the, at the collegiate level, it may be. I'm not actually sure. In the minor league level, I know there's no, um, there's not a lot of, there's no video replay at this point, okay? In the big leagues, there are. I'm not getting these guys ready to be good at double A. I'm getting to be ready at the big leagues. That said, our slides whether it be head first, pop up, or hook, have to be efficient. They have to be practiced. And as I say right there, the foot accuracy is the key, and we have to stay on the base. Okay? Stay on the base. As you see here, this is obviously Mookie. We're going to run through a few things here. All right? We talk, about, we talk about the proper steps at the beginning. No wasted motion. Okay? Efficiency. Efficient. Okay? Boom. Okay. T context. Context. It's a 1-1 one, one count. Okay. They're up 2-1 in the fifth. Seager's up. Okay. The risk is worth the reward. Seager's in scoring position right now. We know that. But Glass now is out there throwing a million. Okay. If we can get a base hit, Mookie scores. He doesn't have to hit a double. He doesn't have to hit it over the wall. Okay. So... He, he assessed the risk. He got the time he wants. He knows how fast he is. He knows what he needs. He's taken off. All right? This is, this is uh, Betts is going to get third base off, off Pomerantz here. Okay, again. Okay, we have bottom seven. First and second. They're up by a run. This is obviously the postseason. These things matter, Okay. This situation is a high leverage situation with a high leverage guy out there. Pomerath, back end guy. Doesn't want to be bothered with guys on base. Doesn't have the, most most back end guys, unless they're really good athletes, don't, don't have great pickoff moves. Okay. Assess the risk, got what he was looking for, takes off. Now, here's why this is beautiful. Look at this jump. Motion, motion, gone. Here we go. Fairly certain they probably had information. He's going to look at the dugout. He's going to go. Look at the dugout. Boom. He's got his information. If he, pick, if he spins and throws right here, he's probably out. Right? But he's, he's assessed the risk. He's done his homework. And we're going to go. Motion. No play. Seager does a nice job on the backside. Okay? This is Alberto Mondesi. This guy is unbelievable. Okay, you show that one. Now, we'll move to this one. Look how violently he gets into that bag, coming in like a house of fire, okay? 
Make no mistakes. He is fixated on attacking that back corner of the base. Boom. Good foot accuracy. He's up. Pop-up slide. Stay, maintains contact with the bag. Key. Key. Don't slow down to slide. Slide to slow down. Don't slow down to slide. Slide to slow down. That's the purpose of the slide. He's carrying all of that 30 feet per second into that bag. Beautiful. Tommy Pham right here. Probably should be out. Edmund holds on to the ball. He's out. Okay. Now, I will say this. Context. Again, 6-3. They're down 6-3. Right? Pham's at the top of the order. So I think it's Pham, Cronenworth, and then Nola. I don't know this is a great time to run. It works out for him, especially with Yachty catching. Almost never a good time to run with Yachty catching. We know that. So he kind of gets lucky here. He still he does get a good break. This is pretty good timing. He has to have motion. Stolen bases at second base happen after 15.7 feet and usually with motion. That was the average lead length of stolen bases of third base. You got caught. If you were 14.9, you got caught. Okay? Now, this is something that normal humans can't do. Okay? Steal a third base. Looks normal, right? Steal a third base. Looks normal, right? 5-3 in the bottom of the eighth. Okay? Why is this important? Romo's out there. We know there's a boatload of sliders. We know he's not very fast to the plate. He throws, I mean, it's almost 70, maybe 75% sliders. Now, you're putting a bug in his head that, hey, possibly you got to get that slider up. Maybe you don't want to bounce it. Now it's a 5-4 game. Changes things a little bit, right? Here's why this is significant. He does what you're not supposed to do. Not only is he not moving, he's got a negative move. This is Gerard Dyson, who's 37 years old who still runs at 27, 28 feet per second, well above major league average. Don't try this at home, folks. You can't do this. <laughs> and don't teach this. That's why this is so impressive. I had to put this on here, okay? Now, my personal man crush on stealing bases, Paul Goldschmidt. When you look at raw speed, he's bang average. But his efficiency in his setups... In his timing, this is him getting third. Beautiful timing. No play. It's incredible. He had a year where he stole 33 bags, I believe, and he is a bang average runner, which means all the things technically he has to do correct, he does them correct almost every time and steals bags at a high percentage. Now, again, re review. Mentality of, the, of a thief, okay? The belief. You got to believe you can get these bags. You got to believe you can get these bags. If you don't believe, stay at first base. Or go do something else because I don't want you. Okay? You can have zero remorse. You are a thief. There's no remorse. Okay? Preparation. Mentally, know yourself. How fast are you? I'm sorry. Know yourself. What, what do you need? What numbers do you need? Reconnaissance. Opposition reconnaissance. We got to know what they do. Calculate the risk in each situation. Physically, know yourself. Okay? And master the skills re that are required for being efficient while executing the skill. And then your environment. Coaches, this is you. Create an environment where it's okay to make mistakes. Whether it's in the fall, whether it's in control scrimmages you set up, you got to let these guys practice the skill. And you got to let them fail in order to grow. Okay? And then finally, the flawless execution of, of all of this. Okay? Flawless execution. I want to say a special shout out to a bunch of guys that work with the Pirates for me. Andrew Gibson, our, our uh, uh, assistant director of analytics, Grant Jones, a junior analyst for us. Uh, Logan Byman, uh, our, one of our strength and conditioning guys, who's really dug in on the speed development, as long as, as well as Corey Cook, our, our uh, strength and conditioning coordinator in the minor leagues. Um, also, these are uh, Dr. Claire Nee, who wrote the article and "Inside the Mind of a Thief." Uh, that's the, actually the 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 the, um, the piece about Michael Shane Durden, the criminal uh, that I spoke about, and then Buster Olney. Uh, a lot of the what's behind the decline of stolen bases. Um, a lot of that information came from there, too. So I want to properly source and reference everybody. Thank you very much for your time, and hopefully we get some more bags. Gentlemen, good morning. 
Jim Richardson here with Coach Scales. Coach Scales, awesome job on the presentation, man. We love the incorporation of that video. Um, I think seeing it from those multiple camera views, every coach in the country wishes they could install something like that. Um, quick reminder to all of our members listening in, Trade Show is now open. Uh, now, more than ever, it's important to go show a little bit of love to all of our companies who are exhibiting within the trade show. Everybody's hurting a little bit this year. Show them some love. Tell them thanks for the support because quite honestly, they're, they're a huge part of the reason as to why we can put something like this on. So make sure to click into the trade show at some point and uh, show them a little love for being here and supporting the APCA. Um, Coach Scales, we've got a bunch of questions coming in from the chat. Um, some of which you answered already in your presentation, um, but uh, the most interesting one that I felt uh, came from good old Zach Casto. Um, some of you guys may know uh, Coach Casto for his uh, impeccable note-taking abilities, but this is a pretty solid question, so I wanted to kind of address it to you. Some of the tendencies that you teach your base runners to look for to make sure that they will uh, be able to you know, the risk is worth it for the steal. And when I say tendencies, you know, I'm really interested in, in the top-down approach because I, like you, was always taught, hey, you start with the feet, work up. Um, it makes a lot of sense. But what are some, some of those tells that uh, you can kind of start with? Or for younger coaches, teaching pitchers even, what are things that they got to teach their pitchers not to do to give this stuff away? Well, I think uh, one of the biggest things um, – I just want to, I look at the torso a lot, the body. I mean, is he in a, is he online? I mean, is it, when a guy is coming set, is there openness? Is there close? Is there, is there, is the, is the front shoulder closed at the end of the day, unless the guy's some kind of athletic freak, he's got to get that online to the target. So if he's got a unique setup where he's open or he has a unique setup where he's very close, chances are he's got to make it either an extra move or take a little bit longer to get online to the target. So if a guy is open or closed, that's, that's a big tell for me. Uh, when I was talking about the left. Is that what ahead. you meant when you were talking about, you start with the whole body first, then you go top down. Cause I, I heard yeah, you reference I mean, that's, that. That's more of an, that's clearly, obviously it's more of an obvious tell, right? Yeah. But, yeah, you know, yeah. And then, and then you kind of shrink the picture. It's kind of like, it's, it's, not too different than hitting, you know, okay, when you're, you know, you, you know, he's getting the sign, you're looking at the big picture, and then we'll narrow the focus to the cap, and then we'll shift it over to the window. Well, it's kind of the same thing when you're stealing bases. You know, you look at the whole picture. Obviously, um, like I said in the, in the presentation, I started as a as a player, I was taught bottom up. I was, you know, in the beginning, and in, in the beginning of my coaching, uh, I was I was taught bottom up. You keep talking to guys who are prolific base stealers, and then they're like, they say they say bottom up too, and then all they talk about is the top down, especially the head. So, you know, logically, we're going to shift our focus. So, um, where the player, where the pitcher is looking when he's coming set, where the pitcher is looking, um, you know, when he's about to deliver the pitch. Sometimes those are two different things. The guy may come set, and he's looking at the dish, and he may, he may, uh, you know, he may look to the sky, he may look down, hat up, hat down. Um, with left handers, um, you know. If the guy's looking at, at, at home plate, you know, uh, or if he's looking at first base, where does he look when he's getting ready to deliver the baseball to the plate? It's difficult for me to explain because it's all it's all different things. But mm -hmm. the key is it's like it's like doing a puzzle, like doing a matching game when you're a kid. You know, you see one thing and then you see something different. Then you see one thing and then you see something different. Now, how how many how how much how consistent that guy can be with that? Now we have information. It can't just be a one-off thing. It's got to be a, a a more often than not thing for you to at, really cat really catalog that as something we can we can uh, we can have and put in our arsenal. Awesome, awesome. So, um, given the fact that you have access to video um, resources that you know the normal general public does not have access right. to, who, in your opinion, has the best uh, p you know pickoff move in big league baseball right now? Oh, uh, I don't know. Um, there there are a lot of guys. Um, I will say this. Um, we we fear lefties so much, and there's really no need to because the caught stealing rate, the success rate is really very, very similar. And in, in a lot of cases, it, it's um, it's higher. I think we, we give left-handed pitchers way too much respect, uh, and we need to run on them more. The, the fact that they're simply looking at us is uh, is something that, that really deters us. I know um, – uh, so, but more you know, specific to your question, I like I like 
a lot of guys that have really good pickoff moves are guys that either were tremendous athletes as a high school player or are uh, converted position players um, because they have good feet. And the guys, the guys who have better feet, guys who have who are better fielders. I know Grinky's got a pretty good move. He's always been a great fielder um, and a very good athlete. Um, so there's there's some guys that with really good moves, but um, there's enough guys out there that don't that we can take advantage of too. So I'm not giving those guys too much credit. I hear you there, man. Now I was trying to get a, a zoom in close up on your slide, uh, specifically when it was the scouting report. You were talking mm -hmm. about times, but you were also mm -hmm. kind of labeling pitchers based on certain criteria. You know, right. like um, you know, if it was they were coming set head down, he only looked once. Um, what are some of the uh, if you could kind of give us a little more, we won't have access until those slides until sure. January 22nd, our coaches. Sure. Um, so if there's a couple of things that stick out a lot that you write on that scouting report a lot, or if there's something you see in amateur baseball uh, from your experience as a player, like what are a couple of things these coaches need to lock in on immediately? I think, I think patterns from, from the catcher or, you know, if, 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 a, if a pitching coach is calling, uh, the game for the catcher, um, locking in on patterns. We know when he gets one one, we're throwing change. They're throwing changeup, almost regardless of who's at the plate. We know if it's two one, they're throwing breaking ball. We know if it's if it's if it's oh one, they're throwing fastball in. You know, for, you know to move feet. Okay, that's fine. If they're if they're throwing fastball in to move feet. Uh, what we what we found a lot of times is, like I said in the presentation, a pitch out is a pitch out for a reason because there's no traffic on that side of the plate. So if they're throwing, if you know we get in a plus count with 0-1, get ahead, boom, with whatever pitch, they're going to go automatic fastball in. Then you know what? I'll take a shot here um, because it's diff more difficult to throw if that ball's in, if that ball runs to the to the uh, you know into the hat hitter at all. Now you've got traffic, you've got uh, built-in traffic. I think that um, breathing patterns. Are a big thing, you know. You've got the you've got the guy that's, you know, yeah. he gets the sign, come set, <sighs> deliver, <sighs> deliver. Or uh, one of the young men in our system who is eleven out of fourteen. I know his big thing is timing. You know, you've got the one, two, three, four. Okay, every time between uh, a half a beat between two and three, he's going to the plate. Half a beat between two and three, he's going to the plate. Half a beat between two and three, he's going to the plate. Those are things, just obvious tendencies. I think one of the biggest things is not to try to get too nuanced with it. Look at what's happened, obviously. Okay, we're in the fifth inning or we're in our third inning, and this guy's faced 13 batters, and he's had six guys on, and every time he's gone 1-1, boom, we're breaking ball. Well, if that happens the seventh time, we need to go. So those are the obvious patterns, I think, for, for guys who don't have a boatload of information or guys who don't have great resources as far as video, look at the obvious patterns and then take off and go. It's, it's great advice. And speaking of obvious patterns, um, I'm curious, how much video do you guys take of those relievers in their bullpen warm-up sessions if there's cameras available? And I don't know if there are. But it seems like those bullpen sessions with them warming up is a great time to see some of those obvious tendencies because they're not out on the field. Is that something you guys look at? Is that something our coaches should consider looking at? I think so. Any, anytime you have an opportunity to gain to gain knowledge about your opposition, you do it. Whether it be them warming up in the bullpen. I mean, we've all done it. We've all, you know, you, you know, like you said, I'm heading, I'm batting leadoff for the for the speakers today yeah. Uh, yeah. at the convention. Well, you know, I'll get out there. You know, in, in my pregame warm up, I'm looking down the bullpen watching this guy throw. OK, that's fine. You know, he's he's you know, he's getting going through his paces and he gets towards the end of his warm up and he spiked the first three, five or six sliders he's thrown. OK, mm. I'm putting that in the book because you know what? I'm going to make him throw me a slider for a strike before I offer it one or or, you know, whatever. So I think anytime you have an opportunity to gain to gain um, information on your opponent, regardless of where it comes from, I think you, you take an opportunity to use it and study it. And, and, and possibly put it in your arsenal. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, coach. Mm -hmm. The next question I'm going to try to tie together. It comes from uh, Mike Polito uh, from the Mid-State Eagles and uh, also John Carter from Round Rock High School in Texas. And uh, John's interested in a dynamic warm-up you could share with you that you potentially utilize. But uh, Mike Polito is interested in uh, how you try to help your players improve their 10 and 20 
yard split times. Right. I think it's really interesting you chose 10 and 20. And I liked being able to see in your chart the differential between like this is the start, this is, you know, the second half of it. Right. Um, so I guess uh, I felt like those two questions kind of tied together. So I'm assuming you do some sort of training for this in a warm up. No, we do. We, uh, we, like I said, we have changed a lot of our program. Our entire warm up for our players is completely different than it was uh, just even, even my first year with the Pirates in 18. And a lot of that came, was born out of, okay, today's play, you know, there's a lot of, in our industry, we've gone from, okay, we got to get this big, we got to get them strong. Now, yeah, we want them to be strong. And I'm, we're dealing with you know, uh, caliber of athletes and different ages of athletes, so we're not going to lift them. It's, it's just different, a different deal. But my point is this, the, the big focus now is efficiency and movement. How can we make these guys be strong, but also move more efficiently? So one of the things that we did, and I, that's why I give a special shout out to Corey Cook and Logan Byman, uh, because those guys have really done it. And the rest of our strength conditioning staff, I don't mean to slight anyone because they've all been instrumental in, in getting us where we are. But, okay, what do our outfielders do? What do our infielders do? What do our catchers do? Okay, let's, let's make sure we're optimizing them for that activity. As far as the running goes, right? Logan uh, comes from a wrestling background. He's a college wrestler, but he has really fallen in love with running and sprinting and speed development. And um, one of the things that, that that we really honed in on was how, you know, helping our guys understand what they do uh, and, and training it. And so here's what I'm getting at. A lot of you guys are high school coaches. A lot of you guys are college coaches, right? And I even remember when I was at University of Michigan, uh, uh, James Hendry was the women's track and field coach, many Big Ten championships. He's had Olympians. He would come over in the fall and help us before his 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 ladies got started uh, with their with their development program. He would come over twice a week in the fall and he would kick our butt. Right. Everybody on these forums, hopefully, whether it be their high school coach or, or a college coach, you hopefully you have some type of access to someone who has more expertise in running than you do. I am not an expert in running. I have learned quite a bit. I am not an expert in running. So that's why we recruited um, uh, Logan to go out and, and do some and do some homework and bring that back. We've we've had uh, the gentleman from from uh, the Netherlands, uh, Franz Bosch, has come over. The, one of the foremost thinkers on running. We we're fortunately we've had that access to someone who's that elite in that kind of training. But just because you don't have someone who's that elite, you have a track coach at your high school. You have a track coach at your at your college. You have a track coach, hopefully at your junior college, that can help you. Uh, optimize uh the the efficiency of movement and their and 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 help your athletes get if it's one step and that one step uh is the difference between you know you got first and third in the seventh inning and it's a ground ball to second base and that one step helps you helps that guy be safe at first you score that run you win a conference championship i think it's worth i think it's worth the uh the investment in the time awesome coach so, so specifically to me that's something that you address with your your you know someone who has an expertise in running and has an expertise in, in movement and then you implement it into your dynamic warm-up and your warm-up as a, as a program awesome thank you coach we got about two and a half minutes left um kind of curious to see how you go about instructing it um i mean are you guys using video and how much time are you devoting to the technique either each day each week um yeah well uh yeah we use video obviously i mean this we got the high speed cameras out we got the uh the gate testing out and i know everybody doesn't have these tools like i get it like I, that's not lost on me um but you do have an iphone uh you do have a stopwatch and are these are these the most accurate tools probably not but they're tools so use them right um, and then, so, uh, you know, how much time are we dedicating to it? It's hard to say. It, it, it kind of depends on the setting. The setting you saw the young man running in, that was a dedicated speed camp. We had guys in there. There was a couple different groups of guys. We had flyers in there who were trying to get a step from, and then we had guys that could run. Uh, and we had one guy that really wasn't a great runner, but he had really good instincts for going. So that's why he got invited to the camp because how can we help him maximize his time, uh, maximize uh, his abilities in that regard? So uh, to me, uh, we, we've talked about this offline. The three aspects of the, of the game that I feel like are under taught are base running, one, outfield play, number two, and first base play, number three, in that order. Um, so if, if it's a part of the game, it's an integral part of the game. Think about it, guys. The only way for us to, to score if you don't hit it over the fence is to have an efficient trip around the bases. So we have to do a better job and pay more attention to running the bases. Part of running the bases and part of offensive baseball is stealing bags. 
Okay. I know it has been marginalized in the last few years because of some of the numbers and some of the theories surrounding those numbers. And I'm not banging on all analytics. I actually love the numbers. Um, but there's context. Dave, Dave Roberts changed the series uh, back in the day. You see what happens to pitchers. Ask any pitching coach what's the bane of their existence. It's, it's throwing balls, walking batters, and, and controlling running game. Okay. So hopefully by wreaking havoc in the running game, we can affect the first two offensively. So for me, that's something that, you know, people are like, I don't have time to do this. We got to hit. We got to defend. We got to do this. Well, if, if you're going to hit, you're not going to hit all homers and doubles. You're going to be running the bases. So it, it behooves you to work on base running and more specifically, the guys who can, who are, you know, have the opportunity to steal bases, you need to get those bags because your run probability goes up the closer you get the home plate. Awesome. That's awesome, Coach. It's a great, uh, great way to leave it. Um, Coach Scales, thank you so much for joining us. Great job on the presentation. Uh, gentlemen, if you missed any part of this presentation and the video, um, this with the Q&A session will be uploaded to our ABCA video library by January 22nd. Uh, if you want to stay tuned here, we got Johnny Wiggs coming up. Um, he is going to, we're going to start prepping immediately at 12 o'clock, but his video will go live at 12.15.